Hello and welcome. Have you ever looked at a legend or a myth and thought, you know, I wonder if it really happened that way? Well, some of the guys at the BBC did back in 1989, and today's review subject was born. Maid Marian and her Merry Men is a very different take on the Robin Hood story, where Robin Hood is just the face of the operation, whereas Marian is the brains. There's a lot of other changes to the Merry Men as well, and since characters are by far the most important thing in a BBC comedy, I think that's a good place to start. Maid Marian is a peasant rather than the traditional nobility in this version. She's resourceful, she's clever, though not as much as she thinks she is, and has a very sort of school teachery manner with the rest of the Merry Men. At the start of the show, she's the only one even vaguely competent and sees herself as a leader of a vicious band of freedom fighters. But most of the peasants don't actually care and are quite happy eating mud, much to Marion's annoyance. Robin is actually a complete coward and a tailor with a very strong fashionista feeling to him. He got involved in the whole business of being a bandit by complete accident. He does next to nothing but gets all the glory from the peasants and all the attention from the villains. He lets it all go straight to his head and develops a massive ego. And despite his real lack of involvement, you can actually believe the legend would end up being about him. Little John is now Little Ron, a psychopathic dwarf. He's by far the best close range fighter they've got though, as long as he remembers to look the right way. Will Scarlet, Friar Tuck and anyone else you may remember from the Robin Hood stories aren't in this version, replaced instead with Rabies and Barrington. Rabies is the group muscle and thick as mud. If a plan goes wrong and it's not because of Robin's ego or general laziness, it's because Rabies got confused, wasn't paying attention or even just fell asleep. As for Barrington, well, there's really not a nice way to say this, so he's there to be black. The problem isn't with him being black, since there would have been black people in England at this time, but more that this is all he brings to the group, complete with Rastafarian hat and dreadlocks, as well as singing bad late 80s pseudo rap once an episode. But you know what? I'm going to forgive them for every mistake they made with Barrington. And why? Because they hired Danny John Jules to do the part. This is a man who can lift any script just by his screen presence and acting chops. He's best known for playing the cat in Red Dwarf, but he's also one of only a handful of things that were good about Blade 2. He can even raise a script with just a cameo. Do you remember the rhyming slang scene in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels? Danny John Jules. The villain's also got a makeover for this show. King John is a big, fat, bald loudmouth in complete rocker gear, including a spiked leather glove and a skull and crossbones earrings. He's got a very big baby feel to him, being as he's always shouting and demanding for things, or threatening to throw a tantrum and fire people, or just torch them if they don't do what they want. You can generally expect him to shout UNDERSTAND at least once an episode. UNDERSTAND! 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 Yes, yes, I, I think we all understand. The Sheriff is a sort of weaselly minded man, and very much the opposite party to Marion. He has that similar school teachery feeling when it comes to his two guards, Gary and Graham, as well as to King John. He's played by Tony Robinson, better known for playing Baldrick in the Black Adder series, as well as being the presenter of Time Team. He actually wrote most of this show as well. Gary and Graham are probably my favourite characters in this show. They're generally completely incompetent but that's mostly down to them not being too bright and getting vague orders from the sheriff. They're really nice guys doing a nasty job that they honestly don't seem to have noticed is nasty. The peasants of the village of Worksop also have two representatives in the cast, Gladys and Snooker. Mostly their job is to be completely sure and absolutely ignorant on just about anything, but they're still entertaining. There are actually two other villains that join the show later. The first is Guy of Gisborne, who is a spoiled mummy's boy and acts more like a three-year-old most of the time, demanding that people play with him and being completely gullible. The second one is Rose, Marion's best friend from high school and a completely untrustworthy manipulator. This show was filmed on next to no budget, and it shows. That's not really a problem though, because some of the best BBC comedies had no budget. What is a problem is that it relies a lot on anachronistic humour. Some of this has not aged well at all. 
For example, and there's an episode that centres around a spoof of comic relief telethons, including a Band Aid style song. Probably the funniest moment in the entire episode is a joke comparing this band to New Kids on the Block. There are other problems too, like the fact the plots are stretched so thin they're basically transparent, and a lot of the wordplay puns are really obvious. You know exactly where things are going in this, and the only things left to entertain you are the really well choreographed slapstick moments and the completely ludicrous moments that you don't expect at all. A good example of this can actually be shown in one scene, which is a sort of microcosm of the whole show. After Robin accidentally gets a reputation as an amazing archer, when a misfire pins the sheriff's hat to a tree, King John sets up the traditional archery contest to draw him out. Robin comes disguised, of course, although instead of dressing like somebody else, he dresses like a chicken. This entire scene acts as a sort of spoof of televised darts. But darts had left terrestrial television before this episode even aired. I know it's come back since, but for myself, I've never seen a listing for televised darts before the invention of satellite television. When Robin shoots, he's so bad he accidentally wakes up a snoozing guard, drops the king's canopy on him, and knocks the sheriff out with a sign. Marion rescues Robin, and the sheriff tells Gary and Graham to give Robin what he asked for. So they give him the loot he nearly took while the sheriff's hat was pinned to the tree. It's all well done, but it's not a lot to rely on. To put a final stamp of irritation on this show, Barrington's raps get old really quickly. I found myself absolutely dreading them whenever I started up an episode. At this point, you're probably expecting me to turn around and tell you this show is not worth your time. But don't count your chickens. This show went off the air after the first two series, and when it came back in 1993, something rather surprising had happened. In the third and fourth series, the feel of the show changes quite a lot, with the characters interacting with each other more like high school students than anything else. Take, for example, the relationship between Marion and Rose. Despite the fact that Rose had set Robin and Marion up previously to have their heads cut off, everyone treats her as someone they just don't like, rather than someone they've got every reason to want dead. The character of most of the heroes changes as well, with Marion being more of a bossy know-it-all than the schoolteacher she was to start with, and Robin being more of a sort of airhead pretty boy who's somehow popular. Barrington gets a rework too, becoming the sort of cool guy, while Rabies and Little Ron kind of get shunned to the side a bit, with only really a joke about intelligence or height to differentiate them. In most scenes, I really think you could switch them over without too much hassle at all. While the anachronistic jokes still exist, their focus has been shifted quite a lot, meaning that you don't have to understand it for the series to be funny. Or, when it is a linchpin to an episode, it deals with something big to British culture, like holiday resorts. They also increase the number of songs to about two an episode, but they tie them into the story much better, including scenes like Barrington teaching the village how to dance. As a knock-on effect, the style of music changes with much more variety, including things like an Elvis-style rock and roll song or a samba, rather than just the bad early 80s pseudo-rap we had to start with. It also means that characters other than Barrington tend to lead songs. Now this is a bit of a problem, because not all of the characters are quite so able to do it as he is. He's been pissed, he's been pissed, he's been pissed, he's been pissed. I've been pierced through my heart by your eyes. I think that contributes... Oh, sorry. I think that contributes quite a lot to the decision to have them start miming comedically to the songs, rather than necessarily singing them. The stretching of the plot problem has been fixed as well, generally by having multiple plot threads that all link together at the end. Again, a good example of this entire series can be seen in a single episode. The Sheriff of Nottingham decides to dig a tunnel under Sherwood Forest to avoid being robbed by Marion, while Robin and the rest of the gang, with the exception of Marion, get really into live-action Dungeons and Dragons. Meanwhile, Rose has developed a massive spot and convinces Guy to pretend to be kidnapped so that she can get money for a beauty treatment. Marion finds out about this and tries to kidnap Guy for herself, but since he thinks it's all a game, he ends up leaving the girls tied to each other and wandering off. Meanwhile, news gets back to the sheriff about Guy's kidnapping, but he doesn't care, until the king tells him that Guy's mother is coming to turn the first ceremonial sod of dirt on the tunnel. 
Robin and the Merry Men build a maze of mystery in a final attempt to get Marion to enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, but realise they don't have enough people. At which point Guy turns up and becomes the last person in the maze, the giver of gift and warden of the used tissue of invisibility. When the Sheriff, Gary and Graham turn up, they go through the maze and the show becomes a crystal maze spoof, with the guards getting covered in all manner of goop. They get to the end, take Guy and the tissue with them, and on the way Gary and Graham decide they're fed up with the Sheriff and treat him like he's not there. Which obviously makes him think the tissue actually works, and insults the King and his sister with immunity. There are actually a couple of other story threads in that episode as well. The plot is really well dealt with now. Incredibly well done and very enjoyable. There's actually a few things that are the same across all the series. The acting's kind of cheesy, but I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or not, since it was clearly intentional. They also break the fourth wall so much it may as well not be there. Again, not necessarily a problem, given their anachronistic humour, but if you're not a fan of that, it's probably going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. There is actually one thing I've not mentioned yet, and it's probably the thing most people remember. The end credit music. I remember that when this show was re-aired in the late 90s on CBBC, there was a massive outcry because they kept talking over the credits, including emails asking them not to talk over the credits. John Wall says, come on CBBC, please don't talk over the end of the Maid Marian tune, it's one of the best bits. So, after having watched all ten hours of this show, gone back to make sure I've got things right for the review, weighed up the pros and cons, what's my conclusion? Well, for me, it's okay. It's not brilliant, it's not awful. But a lot of that, I think, depends on how you come at it. If you're watching it with a bit of nostalgia, or you get all the references and find them funny, yeah, it's probably a good show. But if you've never seen it before, or just don't know much about the British culture in the late 80s and early 90s, it's going to be a waste of your time. Oh, and if you're sitting there wishing that I'd review one of the other TV shows I mentioned in this episode, don't worry, we'll get there. See you next week.